Amen. Matthew chapter 5, we're in a 20-week-long study uh, through the Sermon on the Mount titled, Like Jesus. And we're filling in that blank each week, uh, but the idea behind this series is that we want to learn what it means to be more like Jesus. We want to become more like Jesus. We want to look more like Jesus. We want to live our lives to be more like Jesus. We don't want to just know what Jesus uh, looked like and how he lived his life. We want to live like him. And so that's why we're filling in the blank each week. The title for today is Swear Like Jesus. And if you're wondering what kind of church you just showed up to as a first time guest today, trust me, this comes right out of the text. Okay, I'm, I'm going to point you back to the truth of scripture here in just a minute. Uh, but as we're working through this sermon, I want to remind you that this is Jesus's most famous sermon, but not only that, this is the most famous sermon or message or discourse ever given in all of humanity. So even if you don't believe in Jesus yet, you might want to take these words seriously because it has shaped the world over in some really incredible and powerful ways. Matthew chapter 5, if you're able, I want to invite you to stand for the reading of the word of God. These are the words of Jesus picking it up. In the middle of the text here, verse 33, again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we again come before you with grateful hearts. We thank you that you have given us your written word. That we have the honor and privilege of of opening your word today and, and studying it and learning more about you. We thank you that you have also given us your son Jesus as the living word. Jesus, we thank you that you are the visible image of the invisible God. That you not only came to teach us, but to show us what God looks like. And Jesus, we thank you that you have sent us your Holy Spirit. And so Holy Spirit, I ask again that you would do what I cannot do. That you would illuminate this text to us today. That you would teach us. That you would convict where there needs to be conviction. That you would correct where there needs to be correction that you would also comfort where there needs to be comfort and that you would compel us all toward Jesus so that we can become more like him. We ask you to have your way and we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus and everybody said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. So we are in the middle of a series of statements that Jesus makes. He does this six times in a row where he says, you have heard it said, but I tell you. Now, I want to remind you that before he he entered into these statements, he said that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And then he is unpacking what that looks like through these different statements, that he is actually fulfilling the law or helping us to understand the truest meaning and intent of the law. And, And so today I titled this Swear Like Jesus, again, because this comes right out of the text. And I want to show you Matthew 5.33 in the ESV. This is a more literal translation. It says, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. And so that's why the title is Swear Like Jesus. Now, you might be sitting there and saying, well, wait a second, the title should be Don't Swear Like Jesus. And I thought about that too, but I also thought that might be even more confusing depending on how you understand that statement, Don't Swear Like Jesus. So we just went with Swear Like Jesus. But but also, let me clarify, when we're talking about swearing here, we're not talking about the type of swearing that some of you might be doing later this afternoon when the Indianapolis Colts are getting beat up by the Chicago Bears, okay? That's not the type of swearing that we're talking about, okay? Now listen, just to be clear, I don't have a dog in that fight. I'm a lifelong Dallas Cowboys fan. That's right. Listen, y'all, I'm making disciples. You hear that? Long time ago, there was a single chirp in this room when I said that. Making disciples. And I can honestly say that already at this point in the season, I think next year is our year, okay? So that's that's all I have to say about that. That's not the type, it's not this year, that's right, it's not this year. The the type of swearing that we're talking about here is, is the kind that involves making an oath or a vow or a promise. That's what Jesus is getting at here. And uh 
this may sound somewhat foreign to us because it's not as common in our culture as it was in theirs, in their world, uh, but this does still happen in our world today. Uh, probably the most um, uh, simple example I can think of would be when you have to go to court and when you're standing in court, you have to swear to tell the truth. And so they will ask you and, and uh, sometimes even will still have you place your hand upon the Bible and ask you, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? That's, that's what you're doing. You are swearing to tell the truth. You are making an oath in that moment to tell the truth. And so that's what Jesus is getting at here. And this actually comes from Numbers uh, chapter 30, verse 2. You'll also find this command in other places in the Old Testament, in the law, in the Torah, in the Pentateuch. That is the first five books of the Bible. But it's uh, really clear here in Numbers 30, verse 2. It says, when a man makes a vow to the Lord... Or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge, he must not break his word, but must do everything he said. So this is a command from God for his people in the Old Testament. This is really important. It's so important that, that many times the people of God make vows, they don't follow through, and then they get in incredible amounts of trouble because of that. And you might be wondering, why is this such a big deal? Well, let me remind you that your God and mine, he is a God of covenant, we serve a covenant-making and covenant-keeping God. God makes promises, and he keeps those promises. He fulfills his promises, and he wants to be in covenant relationship with his people, which means that when they make promises, he expects them to fulfill those promises as well. The problem is we're not as good at fulfilling our promises as he is at fulfilling his. Let me show you from uh, the New Testament again another example here. Hebrews chapter 6. Verses 13 through 17, this is Hebrews talking about the Old Testament and talking about God being that covenant-making God. Verse 13, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself. So you and I, we may swear to God. We may swear by God. God's not swearing by you. He knows better. You're not trustworthy. So he swore by himself saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Can I also just remind you that yes, God is faithful in keeping his promises, but his timing is not always the same as ours. As Abraham learned himself, God is sovereign and he is faithful, but his timing is not always the same as ours and it doesn't always work out the way that we expected it to. That doesn't mean that God's not faithful. Verse 16, people swear by someone greater than themselves and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Did you catch that? What we're doing right now, I want to remind you, is we're, we're understanding the context so that we can understand the text. It is so important for us, if we want to understand what Jesus is getting at here in the Sermon on the Mount, we have to understand the context. So listen to that again. People swear by someone greater than themselves and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. And so here, here's what this is, this is getting at here. In ancient Israel, they were an oral society. So they didn't have a whole lot of written contracts and agreements. It was hard to come by paper or parchment and ink and pen. And, and so it was a very rare thing for people to enter into a written agreement for anything. So the way in which they would enter into agreements with one another was orally, verbally. And the way in which they were held to an agreement was by the oath that they made. And, and, and the more significant it was that they, whatever it was that they swore by, the greater the oath was. And so if they swore by God, then that meant this is binding and you absolutely cannot go back on your word. And listen, they took this very seriously. Again, you and I, we, we don't take this very seriously anymore. I, honestly, I think this is part of the problem in the world that we live in is that we, we, have, we have gone away from being people of our word. We're not very consistent. And therefore, we're not very trustworthy. And even to the point where I, I remember as a kid growing up and swearing all, on all sorts of stuff, and I was still lying. You know, you get in trouble? Did you, did you do that? No, I swear. I swear on my mother's grave. I mean, I'm, do you ever think about what you're actually saying? That's a bad idea. We'd still be lying about it. We'd be held accountable for it if, if we lived in their world. I want to show you an example. This is a tragic example, but it's uh, in a pretty intense one. So just a, just a quick disclaimer here. This is about to get real intense, but this is from Matthew chapter 14. 
picking it up at verse 6. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for the guests and pleased Herod so much, listen to the language, that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Let me just give you a little context before we go further into the chaos that is this text right here. So Herod had a brother named Philip. They were both in power. Herod took his brother Philip's wife and made her his own wife. And then John the Baptist called Herod out for that and said, that's against the law. You should not be doing that. And Herod did not like John the Baptist because he was calling him out. But people considered John the Baptist a prophet. So Herod wanted to kill him, but he couldn't kill him. Maybe you've been in that situation before with your kids. You want to kill him, but you can't kill him. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? You feel it? So that's where Herod was. He wanted to kill him, but he couldn't kill him, okay? So on his, on his birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for the guests and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath, with an oath, just again, to understand how significant this was in their world, to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted and had John the Baptist beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. And John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. So listen, I don't ever want to hear anybody tell me that the Bible is boring. I do not want to hear that from anybody. Don't tell me that. If you do, I'm going to send you right to this passage. Game of Thrones doesn't have anything on the Bible. It does not doesn't stand a chance. It's a wild book. You should read it before you say that it's boring. Don't tell me this is boring. And I, I also, I will just say that I think Herod could have stood to listen to my last two sermons over the last two weeks on adultery and divorce, and we wouldn't have found ourselves in this situation here. But here's the point. His oath was so serious that even though he did not want to do this, because he understood what it meant, he, he was in power, he was in authority, but he was underneath the emperor, Caesar. And Caesar had this expectation that he was supposed to keep the peace wherever he was in rule. That anybody underneath of him, any governor was supposed to keep the peace. And whenever a governor would have an uprising in their community, most often Caesar would have that governor's head. He would kill them. And so Herod knew, I, I don't want to do this because this may mean my own life, but I've made an oath. And I'm held to that oath. That's how serious this was. So then let's, let's go back to the text, Matthew 5, verses 34, 35, and 36. Jesus is responding to that. I tell you, you have heard it said, don't break your oath, fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool. Or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair, even one hair black or white. So what is Jesus getting at here? What is he, what is he getting at? Is he really going after this idea of, of making an oath? Is it that big of a deal to him? Or is there something more going on here? Well, I, I want to remind you again that, that when you make an oath, you had to swear by something greater than yourself. And so you would swear by either God or by someone or something greater than you. Essentially attaching their name to yours and saying that not only are you held accountable, but so are they if you don't fulfill this vow. It was a way of guaranteeing your word, your word. And swearing by God's name, again, was the highest way that you could make an oath. There was no other name higher than God's that you could swear by. So here was what was happening in their world. The religious leaders of their day, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they were looking for loopholes. They were looking for ways to make a promise so that they could get what they wanted, but then be able to back out of that promise without having to be held accountable for it. That was what they were after. And so when Jesus says, I tell you, don't swear at all, even by heaven, for it's God's throne, or by earth, for it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king, that's what they were doing is they were trying to manipulate people into thinking they were swearing by God's name, by saying, I, I swear by heaven above, I, I will fulfill my vow to you. And then they wouldn't, and people would come back and say, wait a second, you said, you swore by God. No, 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 I, I didn't swear by God, I swore by heaven. So really, I don't have to do this. Sorry, you're out of luck. 
And that's what was on, on display all, all the time around them. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 23 with me really quickly. This is Jesus calling that out, picking it up at verse 16. He's talking to the Pharisees, and he's, he's going through a list of criticisms for them, and we're picking it up in the middle of that. He says, woe to you blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. You see what I'm saying? That They were, were saying, well, if we swear by the temple, we're okay. We're off the hook. It doesn't mean anything. But anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath, meaning they were valuing the gold in the temple more than the temple itself. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. The altar in the temple, they could swear by, and then they could go back on their word and nobody would have to hold them accountable. But then you say anyone who swears by the gift on the altar is bound by that oath. Why? Because they would receive the gift from the altar. And then he says, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, this is Jesus clarifying, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it. Anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. Who is the one who dwells in it? God. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it, which is who? God. So Jesus is calling them out. He's saying, look, I, I can see the games that you're playing here. Remember, the law tells us the bare minimum expected of us. And they were trying to find any way they could to simply circumvent the law so that they could say, we're, we're abiding by the law. We didn't make an oath to God. We didn't make a vow to God. We made an oath to something that looked like God so that we can manipulate people, that we could do whatever we wanted, get whatever we wanted, and we didn't have to hold up our end of the bargain. And yet we didn't break God's law. And Jesus is going, you're missing the whole point. You're missing the whole point. The whole reason why you were given this law is because God has set before us two great commands. The first is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. So you're missing the forest for the trees here. You're missing the whole point. And that's what Jesus is getting after here in this text. He's calling out the Pharisees for using the things of God to manipulate the people of God. He's specifically calling out religious leaders for using the things of God to manipulate the people of God. And I would tell you that that still happens in our world today all of the time. There are religious leaders who are constantly trying to manipulate the, the things of God in order to manipulate the people of God rather than serving the people of God. So can I just be clear really quickly? You don't exist for me. I exist for you. That's why I'm here, to serve you and to love you and to care for you. The same thing is true with all of our elders here in our church. Yes, we are overseers. We are shepherds, but we're under shepherds underneath of the good shepherd, and we're held accountable to him. So we exist to serve you, not to manipulate you or take advantage of you. And this is actually one of the Ten Commandments, believe it or not. Exodus 20, uh, verse 7. Take a look at that with me. This is what the text says. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. This is right out of the Ten Commandments. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Now, other translations may say, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain, which is a fine translation, but there has been a, a longstanding misinterpretation of what this text actually means. So when I was a child, I was taught that the meaning of this command is that you're not supposed to ever say, oh my God. Anybody else ever told, don't say that. Don't say, oh my God. Yeah, look around, look around. And so what did we say instead? Oh my gosh. <laughs> look at us. How ridiculous is that? Y'all walk around saying, oh my gosh, it's not even a real word. It's a substitute word so that we can say it without saying it. We're doing the same thing. But that's not the point of the text. The point of the text is saying that you misuse the name of God, you misuse his name when you use God to manipulate others for your own benefit. Whenever you use God or the things of God to manipulate others in order to get what you want rather than to serve them, if you're taking advantage of other people in the name of God, you are misusing his name. And listen to me, you will be held accountable for it. 
each and every one of us will be held accountable. Jesus actually says in Matthew 12 that you and I, and this is a scary thought, will be held accountable for every empty word that we utter out of our mouths. Your words have power. Each and every one of us, your words have power. They're far more powerful than you think or you realize. And especially when you attach those words to God. To say, no, 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 this isn't just me, this is God. This is what God wants. Not just what I want, this is what God wants. And so, again, there aren't a whole lot of modern day examples that that perfectly equate to what we're seeing here in this text with oaths, but I can tell you that I have seen this play out in my life. And actually, the time that I first recognized this on full display was when I first entered into Bible college. And so I go to Bible college, and there are all these young single men and young single women, and listen, I've heard a lot of bad pickup lines in my day, a lot of bad ones. I've used a lot of bad pickup lines in my day, and I've heard a lot of bad pickup lines, but, but there were some ridiculous ones that I heard there, and the worst one of all was when a young guy would go up to a young girl and say, listen, I've just been praying about it, and the Lord is telling me that we're supposed to be together. Probably not. Probably not. You just don't have the courage to ask her out because you're afraid that she's going to shoot you down. But if you can attach God's name to it, oh, now I better. And funny enough, those same guys, three weeks later, were going up to that same girl and saying, listen, I've been praying about it again. And God said that this ain't going to work. <laughs> and he also showed me another girl down the hall, and he's calling her name. But listen, we've all been tempted to do this, to attach God's name to something that that he actually didn't speak about himself. So one of the ways I like to say it is it is dangerous for you to speak on behalf of God about something that he would not speak about himself. I'll give you another example. I remember working for the first time, full-time in ministry, working at a church over in Ohio, and we had some individuals come and visit that church and they came from a much more traditional church. And let me just say, I'm, I'm for all churches. God's at work in lots of different types of churches. And praise God that we're not the only church here in Fort Wayne that God's at work in. But at, at this particular church, they came to visit. And again, they came from a traditional background. And, and they came to our service. And we had a, a guy on stage playing the electric guitar. And then after service, you know, the pastor preached a sermon, great sermon, Great service. After service, we were talking, and I said, hey, first time visiting, what would you guys think? And he goes, well, I don't think God really cares for the electric guitar. <laughs> I just thought, what chapter and verse did you find that in? <laughs> Have you ever read about the harp and the lyre? Those are Old Testament electric guitars. That's what that is. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. So again, I just want to caution you, don't don't add your opinion to the name of God as if it's him speaking it. Or, Or another way that this plays out in our world today is to say, well, if you were a real Christian, you would vote this way. To tell somebody that Jesus would be voting for this particular political candidate. Okay, listen, I know we're full and I'm just making some room. All right, that's all I'm doing right now. Just making some room. Can I remind you that Jesus' disciples expected him to take a strong political stance and to overthrow an evil empire and to establish his kingdom right then and there? And when Jesus told his disciples that he was going to go to the cross and be crucified, Peter rebuked Jesus and said, no, 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 that's not how this is going to go down. You're supposed to overthrow this evil, wicked Roman empire. And Jesus' words to Peter were, get behind me, Satan. So can I remind you that we belong to the kingdom of God? We belong to the kingdom of God. And you are a Christian before you're anything else. Before you are anything else, your allegiance belongs to the kingdom of God. And so do not attach God's name to things that he has not himself attached them to. 
Now, again, I, I believe that we should be engaged. I believe that we should hold all political parties accountable. And the problem is once you take a side, you no longer hold that party accountable and you see them as if they're the perfect representation of God and the other as if they're the perfect representation of the enemy. And the reality is no political party in this country or any other will get it right. Jesus gets it right. He is our king. So we attach his name to the kingdom of God and no one else. Okay, before I get in trouble, let me keep moving. So let's go back to the text. Jesus says, Do not swear by God's throne, by, by the earth, by Jerusalem. And then he says, And not even by your own head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. You cannot even make one of your hairs white or black. So you're, you're not even supposed to swear by yourself. Now, that's a humbling statement because essentially what it's saying is you can't trust you. You can't trust you. And it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be a person of integrity and character. We'll get there. But what it does mean is that you must walk with humility and remember that you aren't as in control of your life as you think you are. You see, we live in an insulated world here where there's a whole lot of wealth and wealth can make us feel like we're in control of our lives. But the reality is your days are numbered and you don't know what the number is. You are not as in control of your life as you think you are. And so don't make audacious promises that you can't fulfill. Jesus says, instead, all you simply need is a yes or a no. Or some translations will say, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond that comes from the evil one. And so again, what Jesus is calling us to here is not to back out of keeping our word. It's not what he's getting after. Instead, what he's saying is he wants us to be the kind of people with enough character and enough integrity and enough honesty that when we simply say yes, it is enough for the other person. And when we simply say no, it is enough for the other person. They can look at us and go, look, I... I know the way you live your life, and I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to ask you to swear by anything else. I'm going to trust you that that is enough because you have lived your life consistently enough, led by the Spirit, surrendered to Jesus. You have lived in a humble enough way and a selfless enough way that I can trust that you're not trying to cheat me out of something here. I can look at your track record. You see, every single person in here, you have a name, and your name is associated with the track record. When your name comes up and people know you, they think a certain thing about you. Some of you, maybe they think positive things. Some others of you, maybe not, depending on what your track record is. But can I also remind you that in Christ, you get a brand new track record. And you can start fresh today. And you can develop a new track record. But listen, your name is associated with a track record. That's why when you have to sign for something, you sign your name. Have you ever thought about that? Like, why do you have to sign your name? Because your name is attached to your track, track record. And that's why some of you, your name has a higher credit score, and others of you, your name has a lower credit score. All that score is is a track record. Did you pay your bills on time or not? Did you repay what you said you would or not? That's all that is. That's all that is. Every single one of us, we have a track record. And your name is not just attached to you. It's attached to other people who know you and other people who love you. And if you have a family, it's attached to other people who share your name. Other people who share your name. And so I, I've talked a lot about my brother here over the last year or so because God has just moved in such a mighty way in his life. And I'm so thankful for that. He is still clean, sober on his road to recovery. God is using him in a mighty way. He now works for the organization that he went through the recovery program with. And man, we are just celebrating and rejoicing for what God has done in his life. But it wasn't always that way. And particularly, maybe a little more of a lighthearted example, but I remember as a kid, when I was in school, he was two years older than me. And so my brother, he would will, he will be the first to tell you, he, he would not have a problem telling anybody in this room that he was a bad student. And I'm not talking about like he wasn't smart. He's incredibly smart. He's brilliant. He just didn't care. And so he did not do the work, and he made every teacher's life very difficult. 
And so by the time I got to that same grade, if I ever got to that same teacher, they'd read through the roll call and they would say, Chris Fr Freeman, oh. We got a Freeman, uh-oh. And then they'd single me up, like, look, I know you. I know where you come from. I know all the tricks. I had your brother, don't even try it. I'm like, I didn't even do anything yet. I didn't even do anything wrong yet. But I'm guilty by association. Now, again, let me say, I'm so proud today to be guilty by association to James Freeman, my brother. So proud of him. So proud of what God has done in his life. So proud. It is an honor to be associated with him. And I will defend him and, and I will advocate on his behalf to anyone because he has surrendered his life and he has a new track record. The same th thing can be true for you. That in Christ you can have a new track record. But it's not just you. Your name is associated with people who love you and who are close to you. So let me just ask you, when other people hear your name, what do they think? Is your yes, yes, and your no, no? Are you living a life of integrity and honesty and humility in a way that other people would be honored to be associated with you? Speaking of James, let's go to the book of James. This is also someone who... Uh, had a pretty important brother. His brother was a little more important. Uh, this is James, the brother of Jesus. And in, in James' letter, chapter 4, he addresses the same subject. Actually, a lot of this letter was inspired by the Sermon on the Mount. So I would encourage you to read them in parallel sometime and just see how the sermon impacted James himself. And this brother, James of Jesus, he didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah until after he died on the cross and resurrected from the grave. So he was a denier until that point, and then his life was changed, and this is what he says. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, your, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. So let me unpack this a little bit, and then we're going to connect it to that last statement that James makes. But we live in a world that operates under this principle that James just calls out. That, man, we've, we've planned out all of our days and we expect to just be in control of our lives. And he says, no, no, no. You're missing it. You aren't promised tomorrow. Like your, your life is a vapor. It's a mist. It can be snuffed out that easily. And, and as a pastor who, who has walked with people Long enough, I have seen this happen over and over again. Where, where man, you, you had no idea. Somebody's completely healthy, completely fine, and then the next day they're gone. And listen, this can happen to any of us. You are not promised tomorrow. All you have is today. Today is the gift that God has given you. All you have is today. And so I, I love what James says because of that. Therefore, don't make audacious promises that you can't keep. Don't promise things that you can't keep. Live a life of integrity that says, yes, if, if God wills it, I, I'm going to live with enough humility to say that I, I don't have control over everything. But if God allows, if God wills, then yes, I, I will do my best to honor my commitment to you. But don't make promises that you can't keep, especially if it has to do with, with getting your way by making a promise that you know you most likely won't be able to fulfill. Have enough humility to be honest about that. And then secondly, I love this. He says, don't put off until tomorrow what you know you ought to do today. Look at verse 17. Again, for, for many of you, maybe you've never made this connection. Like, why does James talk about our life being a, a vapor and a mist and, and saying if it's the Lord's will, we should do that? And then what is this, verse 17, how does this have anything to do with that? If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and, and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Why? Because you're not promised tomorrow. So why would you put off to tomorrow something God's called you to do today? Why would you say yes to God and then not fulfill that promise to God that you made? Why would you say yes, but I'll, I'll take care of it when I get time? 
Why would you say yes to God and, and then say, well, I've got some other things in my life that I want to take care of first, but eventually I'll get around to that. You are not promised tomorrow. So if God has called you to do something, then do it today. If you are able to take care of it today, do it today. Don't make God your last priority. Make him your first. Because everything else in your life that feels so urgent and feels so important, listen to me, it's temporary, but God is eternal and heaven is eternal. So be, be committed to the things that are eternal and, and then let the temporary things come in second place. Put God first in your life. Don't, don't put it off until tomorrow because that's arrogance. You're making a bold assumption that God's gonna give you tomorrow. And he hasn't promised that for you. He has given you today. And so, so don't put it off because if you do, according to James, it is sin. It is sin. So I'll say it like this. I've had a lot of conversations over the years, a lot of pastoral conversations with people where they're like, man, I just... I wish God would give me more. I wish God would give me more. And sometimes that's in material ways. A lot of times it's, it's in really genuine, like good-hearted. I wish God would give me more ministry. I wish God would give me more responsibility. I wish God would, would give me more opportunity to have an impact on the kingdom of God. And the question that I always come back to when they say that is, what are you doing with what God has already given you now? What are you doing with what God has already entrusted to you? Because if you're not willing to be faithful with the little things that he's already entrusted you with, why would he give you more? Why would he give you more opportunity? Why would he give you more ministry? Why would he give you more material things? If you're, listen, there are some people who will say, man, I, my, my only problem is I just don't have enough money. And the fascinating thing is I've heard that statement from people who make a little bit of money and people who make a whole lot of money. And, and yet somehow it's the same problem. And the question I always come back with is, well, what are you doing with the money that you have? Are you being a wise steward? Are you being a good steward? Are you being faithful with it? Are you doing what God told you to do with it? Whether it's your money, your resources, your time, or the specific calling that he's placed on your life. Listen to me, God is the very best steward of his resources. He is not wasteful. He is not wasteful. And so if you're not gonna be faithful with the little things, he's not gonna give you greater things. He's not. And, and, and I've heard people say, well, I wish God would give me something more because then I would, I'd be more motivated to do it. You think so, but you're not being faithful with the thing that God gave you that you prayed about a long time ago. At one point, that wasn't a small thing. You prayed about that, God gave it to you, or he gave you the assignment, and you haven't fulfilled it. And so why would he give you more? Be faithful with what he's given you today because you're not promised tomorrow. And finally, I'll just say this. One of the life lessons that I've learned, this is a principle that plays out, and I think this is completely biblical here, is simply this. How you do anything is how you will do everything. How you do anything is how you will do everything. So if you're not gonna be faithful and take serious the little things, then I'm gonna tell you right now, you're not gonna be faithful and take serious the bigger things. You won't. You think you will, but you won't. When you learn how to be faithful with the small things, then you learn how to be faithful with those bigger things, whatever that may be. And so here, here's how I want to close our time today. I want to invite you just to, to bow your heads, close your eyes, and just let the Holy Spirit speak. I want to let the Holy Spirit do what I cannot do. And so I just want you to ask the Holy Spirit now to reveal to you any area of your life where you need to live with more honesty, more integrity, more consistency, or more humility. And we're just going to let him speak.
These are the words of Jesus. This is how he finishes the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. So the question is, what are you going to do with what the Holy Spirit has spoken to you? Are you going to put those words into practice? Or are you going to just hear them? The wise and the foolish builder both heard the words of Jesus. One put them into practice, the other did not. What are you going to do today as you walk out of this place with what the Holy Spirit has spoken to you? For some of you, you're going to need to pick up the phone and make a phone call today. For some of you, you're going to need to go to somebody's house and knock on their door today. For some of you, you're going to need to ask for forgiveness from someone today. For some of you, you're going to need to give forgiveness to someone today. But what are you going to do? For some of you, you're going to need to take action on that thing that the Holy Spirit has been prompting you for over and over and over again. For some of you, you're going to need to sign up to serve on a ministry team today because the Holy Spirit has told you to do that for a long time and you've been holding off. For some of you, you're going to need to spend additional time with your family today and put your phone away because the Holy Spirit's been convicting you of this for a long time. What are you going to do with what he's called you to do? Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for what you're doing in this place. We thank you that Jesus is enough. We thank you that because of what Jesus has done on our behalf, we don't have to earn our salvation. We can receive it freely. And then we can respond to the grace and the mercy of Jesus by being obedient to what he's called us to do. We thank you that this isn't about striving, but it is about surrendering. So God, I pray that we would be a people who live with enough integrity and character, honesty and humility that our yes can be trusted and so can our no. God, I pray that this church would live so uniquely in that way that there would be a marked difference between the people who belong to City Church and who have surrendered their lives to you and those who do not, that it would compel others that the way we live our lives with humility and selflessness and genuineness and authenticity and integrity and character would compel others to you. Even those who don't believe in you, they would see the way we live. And God, that it would, they would see our good deeds as you said, Jesus, in your sermon. And it it would cause them to glorify you in heaven. May we be salt of the earth and light of the world as we go from this place today. And God, I pray finally that you would give each and every one of us courage to do what you have called us to do today, that we would not wait until tomorrow to be faithful to what you told us to do today. And I pray that it would bring us great joy and it would bring you great glory. We ask this all in the mighty name of Jesus and everybody said, amen.